uh, pretty much a hardened skeptic on this uh, this Planet X uh, theory. Uh, when I when I read a lot of the data that was out there, which really wasn't data, it was more like stories. That uh, when in, whenever you started looking for data, it ended up you would hit a dead uh, uh, dead end where you would realize there was mostly circular reasoning. That just because a prior uh, researcher or whatever had stated it, that has been followed through with this 3,600-year orb. And then there was multiple claims that, like, it was a uh, uh, mini, mini solar system coming in. Some say it's a giant planet larger than it. went on and on, multiple. So it was um, pretty much not based in science. And, but what kind of caught my attention was uh, some of the ancient stories that seemed to have a thread of truth or realism that um, that possibly maybe they saw something. It might not have been what was called Planet X, but that, that something had taken uh, taken place. And so uh, I, I did a quick study to start out with, and I said, if this item ever really existed, it should have been noted by the Chinese astronomers because their documents go back uh, almost almost 4,000 years. And I stumbled across a study, and that study, I can give you the name of it, was called uh, the reevaluation of the Eastern and Western records of, of, of the supernova of 1054. And um, I can share the screen here to show some of you viewers of it. Let me um, show Please. this. Yeah. All right. This is, or are you able to see this? Not yet. Okay, it's taking a little while. Sorry. Right. Well, it's, it comes from the Dublin Institute of, they say, advanced studies. Yeah. And uh, what they prove is that we had an assumption earlier in the previous century that the, uh, that some of the data that we were misreviewing pertaining to the supernova of 1054, that we had claimed that it was a supernova. But when we went back and more recently looked at the Chinese documents, some of this data did not correlate with the supernova because it showed without a doubt, an object moving to multiple constellations. A supernova is stationary. Therefore, it cannot move from a different kind. It has to be stationary in one constellation. And come to find out that the supernova actually was seen two, two to three months earlier. And that this data was actually uh, what they call it a, uh, a guest star that the Chinese, the Japanese, and the Korean astronomers had seen in 1054 AD that uh, this was a sizable object. And uh, that's what caught my attention. And I said uh, it was so well documented that I was going to make, make an attempt to plot its course. On this, uh, it, now, right, it, it, you are talking about the one they refer to as Nibiru, yeah? Well, yes, it has uh, probably over 30, 40 names, mm. maybe more. All right. Depending on what culture and time, and time period, because it's pretty much been here throughout the eons of time here, uh, making its path. And what I was able to prove that is this object does not really have a uh, stable orbit, and that if you were to pull a, a set time out of out of the hat, that the 3,600-year orbit does not apply to this. It would be closer to 360 year. Really. And yes, uh, now it doesn't always pass close to Earth. It makes its orbit around the sun. Earth, uh, it's only if Earth is in the same month or, or zone that it's crossing because it, it comes in, let's say, at the end of August, circles the sun and exits around uh, uh, March. So if Earth happens to be in those months at the time, then we have some of these major events that's also documented in the in the Bible and and uh, many other cultures. And using this model that the 
uh, Chinese, Korean, and astronom uh, uh, Japanese astronomers, with this model that we're able to formulate, what's unique about it, that it gave us a 150 to 152 day uh, separation between entry and exit, and both of its path is on the planetary plane of Earth, crossing Earth's uh, path twice. This was uh, quite startling, and actually, uh, uh, I wanted to actually mis mis reject it or, or prove it wrong, because uh, when a larger object is on the on Earth's planetary plane even once, that's uh, that's something that's very serious. And this uh, this 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 object is proving out to be that it crosses Earth's path twice in in the same uh, orbit. And so, what we what what was the next step was to prove whether or not it was basically repeatable. This is the orbit. Uh, that that we were able to uh, plot from the data, and uh, you can, and then we also took some of the see, accounts that were listed in Europe, and uh, but they they weren't as accurate as giving us a uh, position in the sky. We pretty much we only have like it was a uh, it was in the sky at a certain time and date from the. But the Chinese gave us a lot more data, so whenever we overlay this, we can, we can it 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 matches the time and place that the European had seen this, and uh, as you can see in this uh, graph right here, you can see how the elliptical orbit is. This 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 uh, green circle here is uh, is Earth's orbit, and between this is March, and uh, this is uh, the end of August. That's 150 to 152 days separation yeah. between. That happens to match some of the stories in the Bible, like in uh, Noah's flood. Um, when it started to rain, it only rained for about 40 days. Then the earth earth was flooded. And then 150 days later is when there was a great wind, which I believe was a... Uh, a impact blast from another meteor when it crossed the Mr. Debris field at 150 days later, and that actually knocked uh, knocked off or Mr. ejected 71 percent of our crust from the opposite side, and um, that's why you have Pangaea where the continents are you see together at that time because the crust was holding it as one unit. And then after this blast, which is the Gulf of Mexico, the Gulf of Mexico is the largest crater on, on Earth. If you take a look at a map, you can see a lake that's cut in half around near, near Florida. And a large crater has like a double rim. You can see the second rim off of uh, Florida if you use uh, Google, uh, Google Earth. And if you had the underground it's a topography of the Gulf. I could show you where in the center of the Gulf is a flat plain called the, you see, abyssal plain. And in the center of that plain is the Sigby Nose. There, um, I'm not quite sure how, how wide they are, but at least uh, um, 60 or so miles across, I would say. And it's, um, it's an elevated area, like little peaks. Yeah. The rest of it around it is a, a flat plain, which is typical to a crater. Now, the only reason why they want to let me reject such a such an impact is because there's two levels of heat with such a uh, large large hit. You have the initial blast, and then there's a secondary heat, which is caused by a frequency that it emits that viol that violently uh, uh, carbon molecules vibrate so violently that they spontaneously combust. And you have a ring of fire that will go all the way around the Earth at the time. And and that's one of the um, um, problems with such a large crater. But if you read the text of the uh, Bible and apply this model to it in science, 
it actually uh, it actually happened during uh, during the second event when Earth when when Earth was uh, flooded. You wouldn't have that that heat problem because uh, heat is a, a, a water is a good yeah it's the absorber of heat yeah, I get and you. Uh, therefore. Therefore, on the only way that we can have an impact to create the moon, which they, they uh, most certainly believe the moon came from the earth, the earth doesn't have, I mean, the moon doesn't have a core. It doesn't have a magnetic field, but yet the material on the moon is slightly magnetic. And there's found, uh, even some of the samples found that there was a uh, iron ore there, rusty. Well, you can't have rust iron unless you have uh, oxygen and water and uh, to better create the rust. Yep. So all of this is absent from the moon, but yet we have evidence that that something had taken place. Well, it it is required that when it was on the surface of the earth and because it the moon was not created when the earth was molten. That's why the moon does not have a core. So it had to be created when the earth was solid, already non, in a non-molten state. And this impact explains it. You can't have a moon and still have life if it, if it is impacted when earth was still solid. No. And, and, and so, so there's a logic, there's a logic triangle. You can't you can't have a, a large impact without a flood for life to exist, and you can't have the moon to exist unless you have a large impact. So you have this logic triangle that that one is is uh, is pointing out to the other. Now, can I drop in a couple of questions here? How how was how did the moon yes. form into a spheroid like it is? How how did it become this round little planetoid thing? It's a moon. It's not yes. a planetoid. It's a moon. And approximately it, when did this happen, in your estimation, based on what you found? A German scientist had, I don't have his name, but a German scientist had calculated that it would roughly take three to 400 years for the moon to coalesce into a body, a circular, a spherical shape. And um, as long as you have a large enough piece that has enough gravity, gravity is called by, caused by the density of matter. And that would attract the other Mr. Debris to it. And it would automatically start forming into a, a spherical shape. Now, if you look at those dark spots, you kind of call it the face of the moon. Those are ca uh, great caverns. And uh, they're as large as some of our states. And that's because there's missing Mr. Debris to fill it in. You know, that's uh, thousands of times larger than our grand uh, Grand Canyon, but that's only there because it's missing. Uh, uh, there's, it didn't have enough to fill it in. And 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 and, and approximately when would this have happened? This, this would have been around uh, Noah's Noah's flood, which would have been, uh, let's see, two uh, two thousand three hundred forty nine uh, BC. Because uh, the Chinese characters of their uh, alphabet. There's one particular character that symbolizes a boat with uh, with eight, I think it's uh, eight people in it, and that's what one of the Chinese characters. Even the first, the first known emperor of China, became emperor because he was the first one to figure out how to drain the land. Now that's an interesting comment that there was a problem with too much water and draining it, like. You know, it wasn't it wasn't from rain because that meant you know it's, it's, it's something is holding something had to come over his borders and fill in these voids and he was able to figure out how to drain it and he well, became emperor. You know, Mussolini got the trains to run on time and look what happened with him. <laughs> it's always yeah, something that yeah. you don't expect. You know what I mean? So we have um, what this proves out and and this is not the own, only scientific scientific report that I found. Okay, it's uh, there's a scientific report that was uh, developed by UL, a college that's uh, local here. Uh, the actual physicists, there were two of them. One was uh, Matisse, another one was Whit Whitmire. They had did a study that showed uh, 30 or 40 different comets, I believe, in their study that the uh, orbits of these comets were warped yeah. by unknown gravity. 
that was uh, on the edge of our solar system. And, and then that was confirmed by a secondary study, uh, which was independent by the UK. It pointed to the same area of space, Sagittarius. The Chinese, the data right now, if it's going to come back again around, it's going to come out of the constellation Sagittarius. And it's going to come from the ecliptic, which is on the planetary plane of Earth. And now, if we also take into account when we, uh, one of the things that I came across accidentally was when I did the model and I um, picked a certain date and I reversed the model in time to 1992, where the Voyager and Pioneer probes were, that this is the same area space that NASA uh, placed the Voyager and Pioneer probes. Now, what are the odds of that? You can see in the center right here that that, that uh, green line that arcs across the center is the it's ecliptic. You have the Pioneer 11 here. At the bottom, you have the Pioneer 2, and they have another Voyager 1 at the top of here. They are triangulating to figure out the position. In 1992, that was about eight years outside of our solar system. Now, what's interesting, the way this turned out, it's exact. If you look at the Pioneer and the Voyager Pro Rayer, you see how I drew a circle using where planet is. They're exactly the same distance apart from the planet with the same angle. What are the odds of that? We have a real object that's entering our uh, system, and that's why we're having all of these effects of earthquake. Now, from right here, this is eight years out of our solar system. That meant it entered our solar system around year 2000. That had been around on uh, Neptune's orbit. And according to the software, uh, using Kepler's law of planetary motion, with, and we're going with an object with the same density as Earth, uh, but much larger, between six and a half to seven and a half times the diameter of Earth. Yep. And we allow in Kepler's law of planetary motion, uh, according to the model, and says from the edge of our universe, it takes 16 years to reach. Well, that's about 2016. So if you look at the escalation of earthquakes and volcanoes, the magnetic field of the Earth changing, uh, the sun's activity, the heating up of planets, and it goes on and on, uh, the birds and fish kills, yep. uh, the weird weather, weather patterns. This is exactly what we would expect of, a, of an inbound planet. And, that's, and we would see it more it's intense as it's getting closer. And that's exactly what we're seeing. Uh, the Bible actually says that it's similar to the pains of a woman giving birth. It will escalate in that, uh, that manner. Well, I, you know, I think we've all figured out by now that the uh, the government's not going to say, okay, people, you know, we're going to give you the heads up on something bad that's about to happen. They're not going to say a thing. They're not going to say anything. Exactly. They've never said anything. Doesn't that kind of match the profile that the Bible says? Prior to an arrival, you'd see the earth uh, uh, earthquakes rise like the pains of a woman giving giving birth. And that's exactly, and that, this, 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 uh, they had stopped uh, updating the information in uh, 207. And... We are getting more earthquakes in one day than the previous century for a whole year. Remember the, the story about Joseph? Yes, sir. Well, let's, let's uh, take a minute to take a look at that there. Joseph of Egypt. There was seven years of drought. But prior to that, he had a dream. Remember at age 16, he had a dream where uh, 11 stars and the moon and the stars bowed to him? Yep. And, uh, uh, and then later on when he was, in, he was 40 years old, he was in G uh, Egypt. And he was just, uh, he was the second highest person. He was right under the uh, Pharaoh. And he was the one in charge of storing up grain for this devastating drought that, that they were told of that was going to devastate the land. Well, here's a disc in Germany called the Niebuhr disc. And when I first came across this, I was interested because it shows a star pattern, the sun and the moon. Well, you can't, you can't see the stars if the sun's out. Right. Two, two, it's not an eclipse because it shows the moon to the right. Yes. So it, it, it caught my attention. And I uh, disagree with the, uh, the present uh, misinterpretation. They don't even mention that the moon is, uh, is, is not involved with this eclipse. They think it's a normal one. They even uh, misidentified this uh, constellation. What I noticed was the moon is facing the wrong direction. The illuminated side has to face the sun. So if you reverse that, it gives you a different time in a month that, that you have to be looking for an event, which is one of the main things the, the experts missed. Okay, they were looking for like a, I think it was like a uh, three-day moon when it should have been like a 28-day moon, something, something like that. And so I'm looking for a third object that would you see, eclipse the sun because the moon is not involved. You cannot have a crescent moon that's involved with a uh, solar, solar eclipse. 
It's only a new moon that's able to do it. Crescent moon cannot cannot do it. So when I misidentified these outer constellations, which are Gemini and Capricorn, and Pleiades in, in, in the middle from Germany, I was able to say that this was the month of uh, March and April. Then when I noticed that you cannot see this constellation, Orion, from Germany at that latitude, the only way that you can see this is if you had a latitude of Luxor, Egypt. You see this red, uh, red line here is, is the latitude of Germany. If you go to this blue line, that's Luxor, Egypt. And that's a tilt of 26 to 28 degrees, which has happened multiple times in the Bible. And when we look for this certain pattern with the, you see how the moon has a crescent here? This is the pattern of the uh, planets. And we put a third object, you see, eclipsing the, uh, the uh, sun, which gives you about a three-hour eclipse. The uh, software gives us April 6th of 1810 B.C. They don't compensate in, in a software where the, the calendar year changed from 360 to 365 and a quarter days. That happened around 700 B.C. during Hezekiah's time. This happened globally because it's documented by almost every civilization on Earth that had a calendar. Their calendar prior to 700 B.C. was 360-day year. So whenever you, ex you subtract the difference of 16 years, you end up with April 6, 1794 when this happened. And this was the same time period as Joseph of Egypt, documented by the German, the German astronomers. That proves to us that Joseph's dream, remember, yes. where he had a dream that the stars bowed to him. That was Leo. 11, 11 stars was Leo. And the, and, the, and the moon, now, keep in mind, it says the moon and the sun. Well, you can't see the stars if the sun's out, so that word sun actually is illuminated body. It was this planet that, that he actually saw. Because he saw, he said, illuminated body, the moon, and the stars. Because once he said stars, you can't see stars if the sun is out. And so it actually, the, the, when the earth tilted 26 to 28, the heavens bowed to him, just as this text says. That's a real event. And a seven-year drought was correct. You had three-and-a-half-year drought coming in and three-and-a-half-year drought as it left. So midway through the drought is this date right here given by, by, by the Niebuhr disk. We can date the actual event. This object... This is the ancient observatory, which is about 20 miles where that this, this was found. Uh, this is Gothic Germany. This is the viewpoint of it. You see this uh, old river bed right here yep. where they, uh, they had changed the river to better put a dam here. And that's, and that's shown on the disc. You see this bottom curvature, right? It's a, yes. That's the river, uh, river bank you see in front of the Miss Observer. Excellent. So all of this is proving out. And uh, here's an example also on, on uh, what we're looking at. This is the latitude of uh, Gothic Germany. When it moved 26 to 28 degrees, and then if Joseph was in Egypt, he would, he would have moved closer to the equator at the time. And, of course, the Earth corrects itself after that. Because it's like when, when two planets are passing close to each other like this, it's like two magnets, two bar, bar magnets. The opposite poles are attracting to each other, and, and it causes us to tilt. And uh, this happened, you uh, see, before. Now, after, after this event happened, we had the exodus. Now, that's what's interesting about this. This is where I could, where we can prove that it doesn't have a, it, it doesn't necessarily have a stable orbit because we have items that it's able to collide with, like moons and planets and such. We have a Pluto on outer edges that's had a very strange, uh, extreme tilt. And it used to be a moon to uh, Neptune is a common knowledge to that. So what, what hit it or bumped it to give it this extreme, uh, it's elliptical orbit at a steep angle? This was this this particular planet is able to explain many of the anomalies we see in our universe. Well, just prior to the Exodus, it it collided with uh, what we call today Ceres. Uh, Ceres is the remnant of a destroyed planet, which is a part of the asteroid belt, and that is the debris field from this destroyed planet. And how do we know that? Well, if you can use Fibonacci numbers and using a series of three, it shows you the exact spacing of each planet. And right where the debris field is, there's supposed to be a planet, according to the calculations. Well, when, when, when it came in, it collided with Ceres, slowing the forward speed of, of uh, Planet X to about 1 20th of its normal speed. And as it went around the sun, when it came around, that's when the exodus happened. That was the three days of darkness. Instead of, this is similar to the three hours of darkness during Yeshua's sacrifice. But that was going at normal speed. That was only three hours of darkness, just like the Niebuhr disk. It was three hours of darkness. But right here, it was three days of darkness, because it's only traveling at 1 20th 
that's a normal speed. And it took four more passes around the sun before it gained to a somewhat normal orbit of 358. And so what's after the exodus is Joshua's long day. This we can prove out scientifically with this model again. Gil, do you have any idea how disturbing this is? I mean, you're all mellow and everything. I'm pretty mellow, too, but I'm looking at this stuff going, oh, man. Well, I've been, uh, uh, I've had a few years to uh, kind of accept it because I was in uh, somewhat of a, I was trying to prove it wrong. Even though I had data, I was trying to prove it, prove it, uh, prove it wrong because uh, I didn't like the results. Mm -hmm. And now I've come to accept it because it's overwhelming. You can see, you see this green, this uh, green line, which is uh, across the screen right here? Yes, sir. This is, this is, uh, this is the orbit of Earth. Earth is traveling to, to the left. You see this red, this uh, red line, right? that is the orbit of, of uh, planet 7X, and it's traveling here. So you have both bodies moving at, at simultaneously, okay? Earth is entering deeper and deeper into the tail of this comet slash planet, if you want to call it. And it's, Earth is losing its energy from the sun at 4.5 to 5.5% compounded hourly. So within 24 to 28 hours, Earth's rotation comes to a stop. It's only slowing down four and a half to five percent per hour, compounded. And this is how, and this is, and this model works. I had uh, because there's two theories right now. There's astronomy theory that says uh, the tail of a comet is ice, uh, ice particles. The other camp is the uh, physicists. Physicists say that uh, the ruling force in the universe is uh, electromagnetic and that the tail of a comet is plasma. Well, if Earth goes through the tail of this, this, this object, which is like a comet-like tail, if it's, uh, let's say, ice, uh, uh, ice particles, we've got nothing to worry about. Ice particles won't affect us. Right. But if it's plasma, mm -hmm. it will. That's a problem. It will do exactly like the story of Joshua said. It will slow us down. We'll have a 12-hour extended day. Earth will come to a stop. And this is going to be happening again, actually, because it's pretty much mentioned in Revelation, if you understand the the data that it's uh, uh, giving us. I, I took this model and showed it to a physics professor, and these are his words. He says, I'm the first one to logically explain this event and on how it is possible without having mile-high tidal waves because Earth is slowing down in its r rotation, just like you would turn a rheostat or a, a light uh, dimming, uh, dimming switch. Sure. It lessens and lessens. And then if you read the story, again, it, the day was extended by 12, 12 hours, and that... Uh, there was more of the enemy killed by fiery hail than he killed with a sword. Fiery hail was meteors. Yep. And exactly an hour later is where we enter in, enter into the uh, debris field. Takes us about an hour to exit out of it because of the angle that is crossing Earth's path is exactly an hour, uh, which also matches parts of Revelation where it says your doom comes, you see, within one hour. This proves the eyewitness accounts that are in the uh, Bible, as well as the Chinese records. If you can take a misobserved phenomena, bring it into the laboratory, show that it's misrepeatable, that is science. Whether it comes from clay, clay tablets or papyrus or the Bible, you cannot mimic Kepler's law of the planetary motion or the sequence of events according to the model. It has, the biblical accounts are following a scientific model to the T, mathematically as well. So we have a real object, and that's what it, the data continues to show us that's somewhat scary here. After that was uh, Job's trouble. You can read how his flock and his shepherds were destroyed by fiery hail. In the, in, in the next paragraph, there's a great wind that, uh, that knocked down a house that, that his uh, sons and daughters were in, and it killed him, which is a pressure wave from an impact. And this is how Job lost almost everything he had. At the same time, Job was the, the it's account of Ruth and uh, uh, Naomi. If you read the story, it was about a 10, between 7 to 10 year drought here, the way she had to go back into the land. And this was during the time of uh, either Sabbath year or Jubilee because she asked for her, her, her land back. So we can time this even according to the biblical scale of 50 years. Now this is King uh, Saul and David. This is how we get the Star of David. This was the planet that was passing. You had three and a half years of drought at the end of Saul's reign. You had three and a half years drought at the beginning of King David's reign. 
Again, seven-year drought. After that, you get Jonah's warning to Nineveh. This was the same time frame around as, as uh, Hezekiah, but this was 40 days earlier. You know, what's interesting with the story is what's not being said. Jonah did not perform one miracle. So try that today. Go to a town and say, hey, Mr. Repent, and see what sort of results you get. How did he get the results? I think the people saw and felt the earthquakes, the volcanoes, the fish kills, the bird kills, the seasonal change, the droughts. They knew something was wrong because they were well in tune with their surroundings of nature and everything. The only thing Jonah had to do was go and point in the sky because exactly at 40 days, this is what the software shows us. At 40 days, it's just rounded the sun. Earth, Earth is here. Planet X is just coming out from around the sun. You get a direct line up with it. And that's what they were able to see. It was the first sighting of uh, Planet X for them. 40-day warning without a telescope. That's what worried them. And that's when they went into this repentance. The whole town <laughs> repented. This included the king because they knew something was wrong. Hey, you bet. This is amazing, Gil. I'm serious. This is, this is fascinating. So after that, remember Hezekiah? We have an error in the English Bible. It says uh, like a sundial going east, east to west. A sundial would not work because that meant for the shadow to reverse east to west, that meant the earth had to come to a screeching halt in its rotation, back up 10 degrees or whatever on a sundial, stop again, travel four to five times faster forward to regain the time that is lost because there's no mention of any delay in time right here. So a sundial does not work. So when I went and looked at the Hebrew text, the Hebrew text says it's 10 steps, like steps on a stair. Well, that makes a little sense. If we take a step and face it south, not east to west, we again have a 26 to 28 degree tilt of Earth, like the Nebra disk. The shadow would have reversed 10 steps and then went back forward without any time difference. There would be no delay or forwarding of time. The Earth tilted again. I mean, it, it passed close. It didn't pass behind Earth. It passed uh, probably in front of it. Now, during this time period, 687 B.C., that this had happened. Because if it had been east to west, like in the sundial, the oceans would have covered the continents. Then, later that evening, we had a meteor shower that killed 185,000 soldiers that was ready to uh, invade let's say, Jerusalem. If you read the text carefully, it's fire hail that killed them. The angel, which is messenger, can also be applied to this planet when it's passing by. That is God's messenger that killed the enemy, which is a fiery hail. These last three incidents, uh, uh, Jonah, Hezekiah, and this 185, happened in the same, uh, same year. We have Haggai. At uh, this time, uh, they had they neglected to build Yahweh's temple. They only had a tent, I believe. They never, they had went ahead and built their fine homes and the wall around Jerusalem, and they just had the tent, but they never built the temple. The Almighty God mad at him and said, you will work through the Sabbath, which is a Sabbath year here. He said, you will not get rest because you didn't build, build my temple, and I'm going to send an earthquake so, so uh, bad that he'll throw a driver out of his chariot. He said that he would shake the world. During this exact same time, this is when uh, Alexander the Great is taking Tyre. After he built that land bridge to Tyre, he was trying to breach the wall. He had problems. It says meteors came out of the sky, or fiery hail, broke up into four or five, and collided in, into the wall of Tyre, knocking it down, so Alexander could go in. The meteors came from this our planet passing, passing by. I can also time the uh, jubilees with this and the uh, Sabbath year, because the next year on Alexander, he, he had took a town in Persia, and there was an eclipse. Well, when I go to that latitude and longitude in, in the software, it gives me the year before the event happened, and it lines up with the Sabbath year of the Hebrews. Now, after seven Sabbaths, that's 49 years, the 50th year is a jubilee. So after this Sabbath year right now, this next year will be a jubilee year. The Hebrews expect the Messiah to return on a jubilee. And since he said when Israel was formed that that generation, which is basically talking about the Holocaust generation, shall not die out till all is fulfilled, that means it can't be the next jubilee, which is 50 years later. That meant that generation would be close to 132 years old. So he would probably return this coming Jubilee. And uh, Elijah shows up on the Feast of Passover, announcing the Messiah coming. And he'll come three and a half days, uh, which is mid of week and mid of night, which happens to be the same date given in Revelation 12.1. Astronomically, it's giving us a date. And that's exactly three and a half days separation.
between the feast of Passover and uh, the meteor shower happening on the opposite side of Earth at the time. He tells time in units of uh, sevens all, all the way up to 50. And then, uh, like right now, because of, remember the, uh, the Nebra disc we talked about, well, we can calculate to Joseph's father, Jacob, who was a nation, he was renamed Israel. He said that nation was 400 years of captivity, 40 years in the wilderness. Well, now we can calculate the exact time they entered the land. At Mount Sinai, he says, when you enter the land, that'll be your first jubilee. Well, from the time they entered the land to now is exactly 70 jubilees, which is significant in, in the Hebrew way of counting. All across generation to 2016, there will be 70 years. We have some parallel things here that are happening that uh, the math, biblically as well as astronomy and science is merging. Hagar, it happened on a, either a, um, a Sabbath year where he told the Hebrews, because you didn't build my temple, you will not rest that year. You, you will build through it. And, and uh, that lined up with uh, Alexander the Great uh, taking Tyre. And um, 362 years later, you come to Yeshua's sacrifice. And if you read it in what you an astronomical eye, you know, we have a problem. We have a three-hour eclipse on the day, on, on the preparation day of Passover. Well, that's a full moon. Well, you can't have a solar eclipse with a full moon. It takes a new moon. The moon is 180 degrees opposite than where it needs to be. So the moon is not involved with that eclipse for the three hours. A, a solar eclipse can only happen, uh, I think, 7.3 minutes. And Maybe so no more it, than 10. It, so if it's not involved, what is? That means there's a third object. It, it is make... describing a third object, yes. Yep. Yep. And an object six and a half to seven times the diameter of Earth crossing in the model gives us exactly three hours. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Without the uh, Chinese documents, we could not have, uh, uh, that was the key to see, unlocking it. Mm -hmm. And and without that, we and, and uh, it says, as well as the Niebuhr disk, it was just found uh, within this century, I believe, uh, maybe maybe around year 2000, but but this interpretation came within this century. But this is how it came around, and the model shows us whenever it got in between the sun and the earth right here, the pastor gave a three hour three hour eclipse, because during Passover the moon is on the opposite side of Earth, and this was the same point where Yeshua was crucified. The hill on top of, on where he was crucified at or, or sacrificed at, was the same area where Abraham took uh, Isaac to uh, to uh, sacrifice him. This was a a mekra. Remember, I was telling you that uh, the word mek mekra in Hebrew means rehearsal pattern. It doesn't mean feast. It means rehearsal. Abraham was rehearsing the death of a son. Abraham was the father of a nation. This was a rehearsal pattern. The, uh, the mountain that Abraham did it on, uh, a, a Mount Moriah, I believe it is, was, cut, was uh, cut in half. They were quarrying the rock. So they cut it in half and made stones to be able to make the wall of Jerusalem. And that exposed was called the skull, which is now called the Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And... Yeshua was sacrificed right there, right where the original place was, where Abraham was. And there's a good chance the ark is buried underneath there in a, in a secret cave because the ark was not there during the second temple. It was only there for the first temple. It was hidden in between there. So to fulfill the mech, uh, mech raw of the lamb's blood being sprinkled onto the ark, remember how the ground ripped open when the centurion pierced him? The blood went through the crack and landed on the ark, fulfilling the Mekra and it's eliminating the sin or paying for the sin that took place at Mount Sinai because they gave a blood covenant that they would have no other God but him and then they built that golden calf. They owed their life to the Father and, and uh, Yeshua decided to pay for it with his own life. Let's see, after that, we're going to go into secular history and what we have here is uh, the next one is uh, Constantine. Remember that object that Constantine saw that was claimed to be a... Uh, uh, a cross in the sky. Yes. Constantine's uh, symbol was a cross, an X with a P in the center. The cross wasn't uh, created yet. Constantine was a sun worshiper. You can look at the coins here that were printed after he had seen this. This is the deity of, of the sun. And this is, this is the object that he saw coming around the sun. And then right after that is the Mayans. 
the Mayans were a uh, serious drought, killed about 90% of their population because their crops couldn't grow and there was lack of water. If we take, they had uh, multiple counts. They had a long count, a short count, they had other, uh, other counts that they're not exactly advertised because they don't know what to do with them. But if you take the last count, which is called a Baktun, and add that to the year of Constantine, which was 312, you get 707. It was documented that the drought at the beginning of year 700, somewhere around that time frame, was a drought. That's what a Baktun was. They were measuring the time frame between each event. The uh, Mayan calendar is probably an event calendar saying when this object is coming around. That's why they can't understand the different units of measure. I don't have time to investigate that yet, but I'm willing to, I think I'm pretty close. If you look at the, the top uh, right here where it's blown up, you see where, where I've uh, it's enlarged the way they carved that calendar in stone. And if you look at that emblem they have, doesn't that look like a comet? The way they have that circular blue object with the tail looks just like a comet. And they have this on the outer rim of it. That's roughly about how many times that it's passed. So I think the uh, Mayans were tracking. They were marking each time that this object came around during, during the civilization. And uh, after the Mayans, we have the Chinese incident in, 10, in uh, 1054, where they documented that the Chinese, the Koreans, and the Japanese, all three of these documented this object. If you look in, in most of Asian culture, see how they have a dragon? I had, I'd personally taken this picture when I was in Beijing, where they have these large bronze bells, you can see where this shape of the dragon in the center, they got a circular object with lightning coming off of it, it seems like. That's our object. They were very fascinated with the stars as well. And they showed this. Then we talked about their plotting of it. Then after that, we come to 1378, where there was this, we, uh, during the dark ages, during the plagues of the Black Plague and everything, it passed at the beginning and at the end, dark ages. Right here, there's a paint, painting. They say that this is Halley's Comet. Well, we have a problem with that because Halley's Comet does not cause a meteor shower. You can see in the painting, fire raining, raining from heaven. Oh, yeah. You see the trees are snapped because of the earthquake and shifting. Yes. People are holding their stomach because of drought or lack of food. You have buildings uh, broken up. You have the, the uplift of land. You have cracks in the ground they're showing. This is not common to Halley's Comet, but it is common to this object. Then after that, in 1694, we have a, a wooden carving from Germany where they see two significant objects in the sky. And um, it's left up to the viewer to determine what, what this is. It would have passed sometime around that time. Uh, so uh, in other words, it had to pass on the other side of the moon. It, it, was, it was considerably further. But during uh, the time of uh, Joshua's long day, there's documents uh, in, in the Middle East that said Joshua and them saw an object 50 times larger than the moon. That's a visual perspective from, from Earth. Well, you take an object six and a half to seven and a half times the diameter of Earth, put it to the center in between the moon and the Earth passing. That's exactly what you get in visual perspective. And that's really the only way you can get a tilted Earth as well. And for us to go through the plasma tail, it has to pass close. That's what the model shows. It, it uh, lines up to all of their visual um, commentary. And then that's what science is. You can bring... It's observed phenomenon, make a model of it, and prove it that, that it's repeatable. That's science. Anybody said there's no science in the Bible, I'm afraid they're wrong now. There's a considerable amount. Yeah, there is. Yeah. So if we go to Revelation real quick, when it crosses, uh, Revelation is describing it coming very close to us, to Earth in March. Probably missing us by an hour, you know, somewhere around that. And Earth will go through its tail, just like it did during the, uh, Joshua's long day. Therefore, the astronomy community will, will, will miss on its prediction on what half of the Earth will be hit by a meteor shower because they're not compensated for the Earth slowing down by 12 hours because that's a, a model that the physics community is uh, proving out, that the tail of a comet is plasma, not ice particles. So the astronomy community will predict the Middle East on that side of the Earth being hit by a, uh, by a meteor shower they will uh, predict this, uh, this half of the globe being hit, but with a 12-hour delay, the Bible clearly says one-third of the grass, one-third of the trees, and later it says one-third of the rivers. They just described continental crust. They didn't have a word for continental, but they just described it. So what half of the globe has one-third of continental crust? North and South America. Keep in mind that North and South America was not discovered yet, but they're describing it. And so 
I'm afraid there's going to be an error in calculations, and we'll have to go opposite in what the astronomy community is saying. And, and now, when are we due to pass through this thing's tail? They say in Revelation 12, 1. It gives us a date using astronomy. It says, the moon at the foot of Virgo, basically, says the woman. If, you, if you're going to use moon, that means you're looking up in the stars anyway. Okay. So it says, the, the, foot at, uh, the moon at the foot of the woman with a crown of 12 stars. Well, Leo is 11 stars. The 12 stars are uh, planet Jupiter, which is the king planet. And that gives us a date of March uh, 26, 2016. Now, what makes that date very incredible is uh, man did not have the ability to give us that date that far in Miss Advance. They didn't have the knowledge. You see, like uh, the constellations shifts over uh, every uh, 2,100 years. In other words, Passover during Yeshua's time, it was Libra in the skies of uh, Jerusalem. Only today is it Virgo at midnight, okay? Then for Jupiter to be there, Jupiter has an orbit of 11.86 years. Then the moon has an orbit of 29.53 days. But the tilt of the moon, because it's at a, a lean, it's a tilted orbit, that tilt is 18.59 years. For that tilt to put the moon right under the foot of Virgo, as it shows, this is, this is what the astronomy software has shown us. The moon at the foot of Virgo, the crown of 12 stars with Jupiter there. The word in Revelation 12, 1 says sun, but sun cannot be a correct translation, which is most common. In the body, that actually word means illuminated body, okay? Because if the sun is out, you can't see the stars. But the model shows the tail of this uh, comet-like planet. Remember, the tail points opposite of of the sun. The model shows that the tail is only illuminating Virgo, specifically like the text is quoting. It says only Virgo is illuminated, not Leo or any of the other kind. Only Virgo. And this is what the model shows us. And this was given to us over two thousand years ago. To better get this accurate, you need, uh, you need four decimal places behind the prime number to better get this correct. And they didn't have decimal places or zeros supposedly yet. So how could they make the calculation to get it this correct for us today? Seriously. It's not by man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, 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 it's literally impossible to throw a random number out there and get this to be exactly three and a half days after the Feast of Passover. Right. Wow. Remember how uh, the two prophets prophesied 1,260 days? Then they're dead for three and a half? Yes. Well, the root word for prophecy is to profess to speak. Well, they can't speak if they're dead for three and a half. It says that they prophesied for 1,260. So you've got to add three and a half days to that. And then the ones who are placed in hiding, only in hiding 1,260 days before the resurrection and rapture happens for both of them. Well, that automatically pushes you that, or tells you that the two prophets are on the scene in Jerusalem three and a half days earlier than the group that goes into hiding. And this is exactly what we have right here. March 26, 2016, three, three and a half days earlier, is a full moon, which is the Feast of Passover. When Elijah comes to announce, the groom is coming. This, this lines up to a T, and that was impossible for them to guess that date and make it fit the story the way it's told in the Hebrew. Because uh, Mr. Elijah has to announce the Messiah's coming before he can ever show up. I'll tell you, this is absolutely, this is a stunning presentation. You see here, this is, this is the model we have here. You can see how the tail illuminates only Virgo. You can see Jupiter and Leo. This is, this is the software model. This is the timeline I was telling you about. The two prophets are ahead of the group that goes into hiding. Exactly three and a half days. They're there at the Feast of Passover, the night of the Feast of Passover. Now, I'm making something clear. I don't have a crystal ball. I can't tell the future. I can only interpret a date given into astronomy, using astronomy figures of Revelation 12.1. And I can tell you, mathematically, it's impossible for two people 2,000 years ago that, that wrote that to make this fit. When we do see it, it'll probably look more like a comet, well, not as a planet. Because we should have seen it with optics telescopes since the year 2000, because that's when it entered our solar system. It was out there equal to Neptune. As soon as we do see it, I'll be more than glad to say, yes, this is it. Just to point out a couple of them that I missed earlier. The first one is right after Noah's, Noah's flood was uh, an incident that was Solomon and Gomorrah. Remember, Brimstone was, was the account of the Bible. Uh, if you read the details a little bit, he uh, tells them uh, not to turn around and to clear the area before they can do any, any of the destructions. Lot's wife didn't listen. There was two towns that got destroyed. After the first blast, she came back around because she missed her town there, 
and then she got exposed to the second blast. But if you look to the bottom left, right, right here, these are pictures in, uh, you see, Japan during the, if you look at these uh, Nagasaki, you see Hiroshima, these are people and items that were vaporized where it leaves their shadow left on the stone because everything around them, all the dust uh, in the rock or in the stone was vaporized out of the rock, therefore it's bleached. And wherever the, the person with shot is standing is still grayish. So it leaves a perfect outline of the human being. You can see on the sto uh, steps here where a human being was sitting when he got vaporized. And then the wind would blow their ashes away. So the only thing left is a shadow. Same thing happened to Lot's wife. When she came around the corner, she got exposed. The second blast exploded, vaporizing her. Her ashes are blown away. Then they come look for her later, and they see this perfect outline of her. They said, the Almighty turned into a, a pillar of salt. It's man's description, not God's description of what he did. It's man's description. And that's what they saw. During the same time as Lot, you had the, the destruction of the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel, it's, mission, it's mentioned in the Talmud that the top was burned and the bottom sank because of uh, liquefaction. Here's the ancient city of Babylon. If you look, now this is the mid-kingdom the, uh, mid era. If you look for the older kingdom, you look for the south. And what do you see here? You see an area that's shaped in a square with a moat around it. The only reason why there's a moat is because the base sank into the ground. And this is, this is where the actual Zizarat or this uh, Tower of Babel was actually at. It was right there. There's evidence of it right there. And that's what it said in the uh, evidence right here. It actually matches what we can observe. Therefore, it gives it validity. And then with the science information with the planet, we have a reason on what took place. Because remember, the Zizarat is made out of stone. So how can the top burn if it's made out of stone exactly. and brick? Yeah. But a meteor shower would that be a, a pretty good description of it. If we follow the timeline, you can see where it keeps somewhat of a, a decent pattern between unless it's, unless it's bumping into uh, a planet or, or a moon, then that will you see, disturb its orbit. If we look at the, the biggest cases when Ceres was destroyed at Exodus, you can see how it came back 52 years later for Joshua's long day, then 131 days for Job and uh, Ruth, and 290 days to King, uh, King David and Saul, and it finally meets a normal orbit now, a 358, which is Hezekiah. And remember how the, day, the, the year changed now, from 360 to 365. The reason why, because we had room to move because uh, the uh, planets are locked in a, in a magnetic trough, if you want to call it. Well, Ceres is Mr. Destroyed. So that allowed expansion of our, if you wish to call it the trough. So the next time it passed close to Earth, it dragged us outward a little bit, giving us a, a greater distance to go, to go around the sun. That's why it changed from 360 to 365 and a quarter globally in every culture, not just biblical. The, uh, the main efforts for governments right now are to preserve the markets, financial markets, because the government needs the dollars to function. So without the financial markets functioning, they're not able to do anything to help out the people or, or to help out them, themselves as far as building underground facilities or anything of, of any planning, that is. So that's what they're doing right now. They're shielding information from the public. They stopped this type of information in 1992. You can see where NASA went, was actively publishing articles prior to 1992. And then the Vatican uh, Infrared Misobservatory went online in 1993. That's also when uh, uh, Dr. Harrington uh, mysteriously uh, died of throat cancer right after he built or uh, did his observations in you see, New Zealand looking for Planet X. Um, then if you look at how many astronomers have uh, ended up kicking, kicking the bucket kind of early in their life, it seems like. Um, I think the number right now, uh, don't quote me, but I think it's something somewhere between 70 to 80 astronomers that uh, had a interest, you know, a untimely death, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, in other words, if we correlate all of the data, these are scientific reports, as well as our models, and as well as confirm, uh, you know, we can take these eyewitness accounts and prove that there's a model that fits what they show, and it does whether it's the Niebuhr disk or the Chinese data or the uh, biblical data, all of this data is pointing to 
there's 88 constellations. And out of the 88, it's pointing to one constellation, which is Sagittarius. And not just anywhere in Sagittarius, but on the ecliptic. Because there's three fixed points now. You have two points on Earth's uh, orbit, and the third point is the sun. Well, with three fixed points with only a gap of 150 days, does not give you leeway for it to be pointing at polar south or any other direction. It points it directly on the ecliptic or, or planetary plane of Earth, which puts that on the ecliptic right there in Sagittarius. And um, it, uh, the model shows us it would take 16 years from the orbit of Neptune for it to reach us. Well, that's 16 years about up. That's this following year. And if we look at how everything has escalated in frequency and in, and in intensity, uh, what's the proper answer to that? It's definitely not global warming because the math doesn't work out on global warming. Um, this is because all of the other planets are warming up as well. So there's only one common denominator that this seems to fit all of the scenarios, and that's we have an inbound planet that's uh, causing these changes to occur. And it's only going to get worse in the very near future. And what about the, uh, what about preparation for this? Um, I, I, you know, you mentioned a while ago that you think that some, that uh, we could have an encounter with this thing as, as, or as, you know, somewhere around maybe September of this year. Did I get that right? Because that's what I thought I heard. Uh, no, I'm kind of expecting seal either three and four to happen. Uh, around September. But if we read, yeah, if, if, if we read, let's see, Ezekiel, uh, one of the chapters in there, I can't quite remember which one it is, talks about a war and there's also mention of a festival, and that festival is the one that they hold in September, which happens to be the one coming up in September. I think that's the war that Ezekiel was talking about that matches Seal 4. Because it also talks about famine and, and other things that, that match that same seal. Um, so it's at the end of September, keep in mind. It's not at the beginning, it's at the end. Can't, I can't help wondering so, if that maybe that's what this Jade Helm thing is about, to get the troops out there and deployed. Well, see, before that, we should have an economic collapse, so we need the troops out there. Yes, we have economic collapse because the... Uh, uh, remember what they did in Cyprus and a few other places? Uh, what they call it? Bail-in? Where they lock down the accounts. You can only put out your monthly expenses. That's right, yeah. Bail-in. I had talked to a business... Yeah, I had talked to a businessman right now that he has a business and he was going to pay off some debts over 100000 and uh, he had problems doing it because he was not allowed to withdraw anything over 5000 And it was his money. Yeah, he had to jump through hoops. So the average person would have a very hard time trying to pull out anything over 5000 at the moment. Look, uh, looks like 700 there's, there's, million euros has already been taken out of Greek banks already. And, and as I, I, I posed this question to a couple of economists over the last uh, uh, few days, and that is, you think Russia might come to, uh, to their aid? And sure enough, the Greeks are asking Russia if they will come to their aid. So yeah, it's coming definitely. It's, it's rolling right now. The uh, BRICS, the uh, BRICS uh, Association, which is six uh, countries at the moment: China, Japan. Uh, I'm sorry, China, Russia, Venezuela, South Africa, India, and Iraq will have their own banking system towards uh, either end of September or October. They'll have active, They already had 192 banks that that have approved the Basel III agreement, which tells them what natural resources that will be allowed to back up their currency. And the banks will come online sometime around the end of September or, or, or October. If that happens, uh, we'll probably see CO3 before that happens, economic collapse, because the financial people will see the writing on the wall. And so government will stop, go in there and, and stop you from, from pulling out of markets. They're going to freeze things. So, uh, so, the money, so the money will still work. You just can't get your hands on it. Right. You're going to watch your value, your money continue to fall. Mm. And you can't do anything about it. Because they've got, they put a freeze in, in effect. You can only pull out your monthly expenses. <laughs> and I suppose you have to present your self-assessment sheet to them before uh, they can determine what amount that will be for your monthly expenses. Yeah. That sounds cool. Oh, yeah. It's, it, it, it's, it's, uh, we have a trap being uh, sprung on us that's incredible. But, um, yeah, there's, uh, according to Revelation 12.1, that date for the meteor shower. And remember, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm just saying this as a lineup. All past events happen in March, March and April, depending you know, on, on the way you look at it. The modern day would be March, and that, that, uh, that was March 26, according to Revelation 12.1. And um, that matches with the Hebrew, fe the, uh, the Hebrew feast. So uh, 
uh, you know, there's a there's a Hebrew requirement on uh, that particular. Uh, on, there's three feasts you suppose you are required to be in Jerusalem to better celebrate that. So, and uh, the feast of Passover is one of them. So, for you to see the two prophets and to meet Yeshua, you need to be in Jerusalem, and and it makes perfect sense because that's the safest place to be at the point because that's a pivot point when Earth starts to tilt. That will be the least affected area. If you're in other areas of the world, you're going to catch hell. Okay, that's it. I'm putting on my calendar. We're going to Jerusalem. <laughs> yeah, I'm laughing, but I'm not really, uh, I'm not laughing because I'm not serious. <clears throat> we'll broadcast from Jerusalem. Yeah, whenever, remember, it said the Bible tells us we have to see a sign in the heavens. Yeah. And now we know what that sign is. It's the sign of, uh, of uh, Joshua, uh, Jonah, with the 40-day warning. That was the sign he was talking about. We'll see it before that if you're attentive. You'll see a comet. And they'll probably announce it as a comet. But it's actually a, a comet planet. And um, and you'll see some. So what we're fixing to see right now, remember, we're in a Sabbath year right now. Anyone who follows the Hebrew uh, rehearsal patterns, that means you're storing up one year of food uh, either in the sixth year or in the seventh. The poor are furnishing their food right now. You're supposed to have one year of food. And that's going to prepare you for seal three and four. Uh, how can you buy food if you're under economic collapse and you can't withdraw large sums of money to get prepared? So, and then you don't wait until the seal four, which is war, pandemic, disease, famine. You have to prepare before that. And so what is our timing? It is the Hebrew feast and the rehearsal patterns. He says in, in, a, in, a, in a Sabbath year to, to store up one year of food, and that's why. Then if you look at uh, Jacob's trouble, well, you go read the story on his marriage. He worked seven years, and got a, he was tricked, and he got a false bride, a bride that he didn't know anything about. Yeah. Then he had to work another seven years for his true bride. Well, we're the bride, so let's 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 reverse that for the groom, okay? Yeah. If you start from September 11 when the war started against against Jacob, right there, that was September 11. That happened to be a, a Sabbath year, Sabbath year, you know. That meant contracts in you know in and started the, at the end of that year. So you start counting the following year after that, seven years. Then we have to go another seven years. Okay, which we're now in the Sabbath again, and contracts were in at the end of the Sabbath. Then we enter a jubilee. Well, it's known by the Messianic community that the Messiah will return on a jubilee. The true groom will be returning. And the Bible tells us this generation shall not pass away before all is fulfilled. And I would refer to the generation that saw Israel born, the Holocaust generation. We can't go to the next jubilee. They'll be 132 years old. It's this jubilee coming up. People say it's not signed. I'm sorry, they're wrong. Biblically, it is signed. You have to look at it in the right person. Only within the last uh, 15 years or less has the physicists gained ground in their own theory that the universe is electromagnetic rule, not gravity rule, and that the tail of a comet is plasma. Remember that comet that passed near Mars? The physicists predicted, because of the proximity it was passing near Mars, that there'd be an electrical discharge between the two. The astronomer said, no, the tail is ice particles. You can't have electrical. They observed it. Guess what? We had electrical discharges. I remember. Uh, the tail of a comet is plasma. Right now, we have this battle, and astronomy is, you got the majority going to the astronomy side. They're going to be wrong on this upcoming event. They're going to predict the wrong half of this Earth because they're using the wrong model. There's a biblical model that proves out the physicists, the physics, and it works. People need to get in line with proper science and proper biblical uh, models. Because all these stories in the Bible are not accidents. They're data points telling you the end, giving you the data you need for, to understand the last book of the Bible. To save your life, physical life. Not your soul, not your spiritual life, your physical life. It says only a remnant will save their physical life. Many will save their, their spirit, but only a very, that path that saves their physical life. Is very narrow. Broad is the is the road to destruction, where your physical body gets destroyed. But you gotta start reading Hebrew and understanding the Hebrew customs, 
and my Messiah is Yeshua. That's his Hebrew name. Because there's no J or J sound or J letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Right. So how can his name be Jesus? It was Yahshua. Now I'm hearing Yeshua a lot, but I heard Yahshua. Yeah, his, uh, his uh, full name is Yahushua. His shorter name is Yahshua, which is a short, shorter version. Both, both are absolutely correct. But that's the more Aramaic version, which is fine. Aramaic is 70% alike to Hebrew. There, there's very little difference between the two. And I suggest people do the walk. Don't believe me. Go find it out. Go find out for yourself. The Bible says in the end times, the truth of the, of the Torah will be very rare. Uh, that you can go to a Christian bookstore. There's 2,600 2, different Bibles, I believe it is. Only 2,600. I have a copy, right? That means they have to change something, right? Oh, yeah. That means it definitely didn't become the original. Not a single one of them have the 6,000 olives and tobs in it. Olives and tobs is, is two characters that Yeshua says, I am this mystery. I am the olive and tobs. There's There is no English word to represent olive and tobs. There's only the Hebrew characters. You better be a person that seeks knowledge. If you're one that just sits there and gets spoon-fed by someone that's corrupting it, then you deserve exactly what you're going to get. You have to do your own research. I'll point you to it, but it still leaves you. You have to do it. You cannot rely on someone else because your salvation is yours. I have nothing to gain in this. I'm not seeking a profit or a dollar to this. Matter of fact, I have more to lose than, than to gain because uh, I was a skeptic to a certain point about this, and my eyes were open because when you start looking for facts and you think they're not there and you run into them, and I'm talking about documented, scientific, you know, that's data. And when you can build a model that proves out eyewitness accounts, that's called science. Wake up, people. This is it. It's coming. Whether you like it or not, you can put your head in the sand, but it's not going to do you any good because the majority of your body sticking out. It's going to get to be exposed to the meteor shower coming up.